Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to this session in ophthalmology. So uh, the, in this session, I will be discussing one of the topics which um, I mean over a very long time I have realized this is one of the topics where students have a lot of problems and that is the optics of the refractive errors. So students keep telling me that uh, they are unable to understand this topic. So I thought that in this short session, what we'll do is we will discuss the optics. And in another session, I will discuss about the glass prescriptions and about the clinical features of the refractive error. So this is like the, one of the first sessions that I will be doing on, um, on refraction. So in this, as I said, let us concentrate on the optics. So when we talk about the eye as an optical system, now what is the purpose of the eye as an optical system? The purpose of the eye as an optical system is like when they see the rays of light, they come and they touch the eye, then they have to be bent. So I'll just draw this like this. So suppose these are representing the rays of light and these rays, they have to pass through the eyeball and they have to meet at this point and this point is called the image. So when we talk about the eye as an optical system for some time we have to forget that it's a biological structure and we will just consider it as an optical system. So now when this is an optical system see these are the parallel rays of light. These rays of light as they are passing through the different ocular structures they are being bent and ultimately they are being made to meet at this point where an image of the distant object we can say is formed that is when we consider this as an optical system so basically this eye functions as a convex or a converging lens right so this eye it functions as a convex or a converging lens right so what do we mean by a convex or a converging lens see these are the parallel rays of light parallel rays of light means what parallel rays of light means these are the distant rays and these rays when they pass through this convex or a converging lens they ultimately meet at this point and this point what is this point called what is this point called this point is called as the focus of this particular lens right so this is called as the focus or the focal point now when the eye functions as an optical system now in the next picture see what we'll do is we will just replace this convex lens with the picture of the eye so see now these are the parallel rays which are touching the eye so these are the parallel rays when i say parallel rays i mean rays of light which are coming from a distant object now when these pass through the eyeball, these rays are bent and ultimately they meet at this point. Now here there is a screen, right? What is the screen where the image is cast? Obviously with respect to the eye, this is the retina. So see, when you consider the eye as an optical system, what is it behaving like? It is also behaving like a converging or a convex lens. It is also be behaving as a converging or a convex lens. Right now, if it is a converging or a convex lens, obviously it is going to have some power also, right? So, what is the refractive power of this eyeball? What is the refractive power of the eyeball? A commonly asked question. So, the refractive power of this eyeball is about 58 to 60 diopters. So, the refractive power of the eyeball is 58 to 60 diopters. But you all can understand that when I say that this eyeball just functions as a converging or a convex lens, it's obviously an oversimplification. There are a number of ocular structures which together make up this optical system, right? So what are they? Look at the structures in the pathway of light. Which are the structures through which the light is passing? It is obviously passing through the cornea, the aqueous humor, the lens and the vitreous humor, right? So this is your cornea. The anterior most structure is the cornea. Then comes your aqueous humor, then the lens and then the vitreous humor. So these are the refractive media of the eye. Now our total power is around 58 to 60 diopters. Now this power is contributed by these structures. So out of this about two third of the power which is around 44 diopters of power is coming from the cornea. And the remaining like about 16 diopters this is coming from the lens. 
so basically these this the cornea is the structure which causes the maximum bending of the light rays maximum refractive power means what obviously it means maximum bending of the light rays and the remaining refractive power is contributed by the lens right so this is about the refraction of the distant rays so this is how a distant object from where parallel rays are coming this is brought to focus on the retina but see in practice all the time we are not looking at distant objects we also have to look at near objects now let us assume that this eyeball keeps a constant power of 60 diopters then what will happen if the eyeball keeps a constant power of 60 diopters then the distant rays will focus on the retina but the near rays will not focus on the retina so this means that the eyeball needs to constantly keep changing its focus and this process you all know this is called as accommodation right so let me go back to this image and see these are the distant rays right which are the parallel rays now if this keeps a constant power of 60 diopters then what do you think is going to happen to rays of light which are coming from a near object here see if this maintains the same power then these near rays are going to end up meeting here that is at this point f dash which is behind the retina but that's we don't want that we want these rays also to meet on the retina right so then what do you have to do see these rays the near rays they are diverging rays okay so if you want to make them meet here instead of here we if we want them to meet at the point f instead of f dash we have to increase the power and that is called as a so basically what are we doing in accommodation from an optics point of view from an optics point of view accommodation means an increase in the refractive power of the eyeball so it is an increase in the refractive power of the eye now how is this made about this happens because there is a change in the curvature of the crystalline lens so see this is a distant focus you can see the shape of the crystalline lens and see what has happened there is an increase in the curvature of the crystalline right so this is a near focus so when there is when you try to look at a near object or you accommodate there is an increase in the curvature of the lens and the net result of this is that there is an increase in the refractive power of the eyeball so therefore the near rays will also now go and meet on the so when your accommodation is relaxed that is in an emetropic eye when you have about 60 diopters of power the distant rays they focus on the retina but if I keep this power as constant, then the near rays will end up focusing behind the retina. But I don't want that. When I am trying to look at a near object, therefore, I will have to increase my power. And that's called as accommodation. And how is this brought about? This is brought about by increasing the curvature of the crystalline. Right? So this is the normal refraction. Now, as we age, as we grow older, then this ability to accommodate, it becomes lesser or it decreases. Now, do you know what this is called? What is the name of this condition where the amplitude of accommodation decreases with age? I think all of you know this. This is called as presbyopia. So, what is presbyopia? Please remember, presbyopia is not an error of refraction. It is a decrease in the amplitude of accommodation with age. It is a decrease in the amplitude of accommodation with age. Okay, so what is the age at this which starts? So this starts, the onset of this is at around 40 years of age. So the onset is around 40 years of age so which means that all of us as we become 40 years old our amplitude of accommodation will decrease then what will happen if you're not able to accommodate what will happen if you're not able to accommodate obviously you're going to have a difficulty in near vision there will be a difficulty in near vision so these patients essentially their distance vision is good they have no problem for distance vision but when they are doing something near like they are not able to read write very 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 well because the vision is blurred so while reading writing while looking at their mobiles they have a problem so this is press bio so obviously how are we going to help them obviously we are going to help them by giving glasses now try to think and tell me what kind of glasses should we give them should we give them plus lenses or minus lenses? 
I think all of you would have got, got the answer. We obviously have to give them plus lenses, that is convex lenses. So we have to give them a convex lens or plus lens. Why? Because see, we need to increase their power. When you want the near rays to focus on the retina, you need to increase the refractive power of the eye, which the eye is doing physiologically by accommodation. Now, if the eye is not able to accommodate, meaning if the eye is not able to increase its own power while looking at a near object, that's when presbyopia is happening. So then if the patient is not able to increase his own power, we have to give it in the lenses. So we have to give convex lenses or plus lenses, but these need not be used all the time. They can be used only for near work. So convex lenses or plus lenses for near work, that is the treatment of red. Right? Now, can you think and tell me what does a presbyopic correction depend on? What does the presbyopic correction depend on? So, what does the presbyopic correction depend on? Obviously, the presbyopic correction depends on two things. One is the age of the person. So, common sense says that a 60 year old is going to require more correction than a 40 year old. So, as you age, your accommodation becomes worse. So, you will need mode correction. So this presbyopic correction or this near addition depends on the age of the patient and it depends on your working distance. Now let me tell you what is working distance. See for most of us who are reading or writing or using mobiles, our working distance is this. This is like about 33 to 40 centimeters. But suppose somebody is a diamond cutter or somebody is a tailor. That person is going to hold these objects much more closer to his or her eye. So then the working distance will decrease and if the working distance decreases you will require more correction right so the closer you bring the object the more power you will need so this presbyopic correction depends on the age and the working distance of the patient now if i keep the working distance constant that is when you have a standard working distance so what is our standard working distance? I told you, most of us who are reading, writing and using mobile phones, our standard working distance is around 33 to 40 centimeters, right? So now, if I keep a standard working distance, then my correction is going to depend obviously on the age. So for the age of 40 years, we give a correction of plus 1. And for every 5 years, we are going to increase the correction by 0.5. So at 45 years, what will be our correction? At 45 years, our correction is going to be 1.5. At 50 years, what will be our correction? Obviously, plus 2. At 55 years, the correction is going to be plus 2.5. And for 60 years or above, for 60 years or above, our correction is going to be plus 3. So, when I keep the working distance standard, then my correction depends on the age. So, we start the correction with plus 1 at 40 years of age and as you grow older, for every 5 years, you increase the correction by 0. So, this is the normal refraction. So, see what are the things we discussed? We discussed about the, the refraction in the normal eye. We discussed about the distance the refraction of the distant rays, the refraction of the near rays. We discussed about presbyopia, which is a physiological change. So this presbyopia, mind you, this is not an error of refraction. This is a physiological change. So this physiological change is going to happen to everyone. Right? So these are the things that we have discussed. Now let's come to the optics of the different types of refractive errors. So I think all of you are aware what are the different types of refractive errors. The different types of refractive errors are myopia, hypermetropia and astigmatism. So myopia, hypermetropia and astigmatism, these are the three types of refractive errors. So as I said in this session, I am going to discuss the, the optics of these refractive errors and in subsequent sessions, we will discuss the other clinically relevant points also. So let us look at this image. To look at this image, then how do we define myopia? See, these are the parallel rays or the distant rays. And these parallel rays or distant rays after refraction, they are meeting at this point F, which is in front of the retina, right? 
So, parallel rays or distant rays after refraction through the eyeball, if they meet at a point F which is in front of the retina, this refractive error, this is called as myopia or we call it as simple myopia. So, this is a simple myopia. So, this is an image, a common image based question in the exam. So, if we get this image, how do we identify as I told you the parallel rays or the distant rays after refraction, they meet at a point F which is in front of the retina. This is simple myopia. Right now, the counterpart of this is what obviously the counterpart of this is simple hypermetropia. So, look at this image. So, here what do you see? These are the parallel rays, that is the distant rays. These are the parallel rays or the distant rays, and after refraction, they are meeting at this point F, which is behind the retina. So, exactly the opposite of myopia, I told you. So, in myopia, they are meeting at the point F which is in front of the retina and here they are meeting at this point F behind the retina. So, this is called as simple hypermetry. So, these are the two simple images. So, one, they meet, the rays are meeting at a point F in front that is simple myopia. In the other one, they are meeting at the point F behind the retina. So, it is simple hypermetry. Right? Now, I come to the difficult part that is astigmatism. Now, to understand astigmatism, I want you to look at these two images. So, see what is astigmatism? Astigmatism means that here, see normally we consider our eyeball to be something like this. We consider this to be like a perfect sphere, right? We consider this to be like a perfect sphere, which means like this is very much similar to a football. So, see the vertical and the horizontal curvatures, we think we want them to be equal or we consider them to be equal when we think that the eyeball is like a perfect sphere or a football. But see, in most cases, the eyeball is not like a football, it is more like a rugby ball. So, it's either like this or it is like this, which means that the V and the H are actually not equal. So, either the V is more than the H or the H is more than the V. This is what usually happens. So, therefore, what happens is that the two principal meridians of the eye, if they are not equal, then the rays are not going to meet at a single point F. Instead, they will meet at two focal points that is F1 and F2. So, this is the problem with astigmatism. So, in astigmatism, see the problem is that the two principal meridians of the eye, their curvature or their refractive power is not equal. So, if the curvature and the refractive power of the two principal axis or the two principal meridians of the eyeball are not equal, then all the rays are not going to meet at a point, right? They will meet at two points uh, instead of one point. So, see in myopia and hypermetropia, this point F is defective. It's not meeting on the retina, but still there is only a single point F. So, in myopia, there was a single point F in front of the retina. Here, there is a single point F which is behind the retina. In astigmatism, there are two focal points F1 and F2. So, when you get an image-based question on astigmatism, what do you have to do? First, to identify that this is astigmatism, see the parallel set of rays which came in, they came in as a single bundle. But after refraction, see they have not met at a single point. They have met at two points. So now these, the next few images that I'm going to show you, they are actually images of the different types of astigmatism and this is important for exam. So I'll help you with one. I think the others you will be able to do on your own. So, see, these are the parallel set of rays or the distant rays which have come in and after refraction, they are meeting at these two points. I will name this as F1 and I will name this as F2. So, what can we say about the axis which is meeting at F1? See, the axis which is meeting at F1 is actually normal, doesn't have any refractive error. So, it's normal but we don't say normal. What do we say? We say emetropic. So, this axis which is meeting at F1, it is emetropic or normal. And what are we going to say about the axis F2? The axis F2, this is myopic. So, see here, what do you see out of the two principal axes? One axis is normal or emetropic and the other axis is myopic. So, this kind of astigmatism, this is called as 
एस एम ए दैट इज सिंपल मायोपिक अस्टिग्मैटिज्म सिंपल मायोपिक अस्टिग्मैटिज्म एस एम ए और सिंपल मायोपिक एस्टिग्मैटिज्म so out of the two axes one axis is emetropic or normal and the other axis is myopic so one axis is normal the other axis is defective and if the defective axis is myopic we are going to call this as sma simple myopic astigmatism so what is the counterpart of this see if you get this image i think now you will be able to identify it in the exam have a look at this image this is exactly the counterpart of the previous one so have a look at this these are the parallel set of rays and they are meeting at two points f1 and f2 now from what we discussed previously i think you should be able to tell me what we should say about f1 and what we should say about f2 see f1 again is emetropic right because it is meeting on the retina and what about f2 f2 is it's meeting behind the retina so this is hypermetropic so here also see one axis is normal and only one axis is defective and the defective axis is hypermetropic so this is called as sha what does sha stand for sha stands for simple hypermetropic astigmatism so these two are counterparts of each other so what do we understand from here we understand that in simple astigmatism one axis has to be normal and only one axis would be defective so see in this picture the defective axis is myopic so i'm calling it sma simple myopic astigmatism whereas here the defective axis is hypermetropic so i'm calling it sh right now let's take it a step further let's have a look at this picture now here what do you see here you see these are the parallel set of rays and if i name this as f1 and this as f2 what can we say about f1 and f2 see we can say that f1 and f2 they are both myopic right both are meeting in front of the retina so both are myopic but they are not equally myopic right so which is more myopic f1 is more myopic than f2 because it is further away from the retina so in this what the definition of this is here in this kind of refractive error both the axes are defective so see both of them are myopic but one of the axes is more myopic than the other so both axes are myopic but one axis is more myopic than the other so this is going to be called as cma what is cma cma is compound myopic astigmatism so this is called as cma that is compound myopic astigmatism now what is the counterpart of this the counterpart of this is this so how do you define this so here see these are the parallel set of rays and they are meeting at two points we will name this as f2 and this will name this as f2. so what can you tell me about f1 and f2 see both f1 and f2 here both of them are meeting behind the retina so what do we call them both of them are obviously now hypermetropic right so both are hypermetropic but they are not equally hypermetropic so both axes are defective but one is more defective than the other so both f1 and f2 are hypermetropic but f1 more than f2 so what are we going to call this this we are going to call as cha that is compound hypermetropic as so this is cha that is compound hypermetropic astigmatism so see what do you understand in cma and cha in cma and cha both the axes are defective so see both are myopic but one is more myopic than the other we are calling it as cma compound myopic astigmatism and if both are hypermetropic and one is more hypermetropic than the other we are calling it as cha right now the last one look at this picture so see here what do you see these are the parallel set of rays and they are meeting at two points f1 and f2 so what are these two points f1 is meeting in front of the retina so what is it it is myopic and what do we say about f2 f2 is hyper so here also see both the axes are defective but one is myopic and the other is hypermetropic so this we are going to call as mixed astigmatism or ma so this we are going to call as mixed astigmatism or so all these images are like really really important for exam i'll just quickly go through this once more the types of astigmatism 
See, in simple myopic astigmatism, one axis is normal, the other is myopic. In simple hypermetropic astigmatism, again, one axis is normal and the other is hypermetropic. If both axes are myopic, but one is more myopic than the other, we are going to call as compound myopic astigmatism. If both axes are hypermetropic and one is more hypermetropic than the other, we are going to call this as compound hypermetropic astigmatism. Now, out of the two axes, if one is myopic and the other is hypermetropic, we are going to call this as mixed astigmatism. So, all these images have, have high probability of being asked in the exam. So, this is the optics of the refractive errors, which is where we have discussed the image-based questions that can come. Now the last picture that I am going to show you here is this picture. This has been asked in this last NEAT PG I believe. So here all these five types of astigmatism that we have discussed that is SMA, SHA, CMA, CHA and MA. When you display them, when you put them all in one single picture, this is that picture and what is this called? This is called as your Sturm's conoid. So, Sturm's conoid. So, let me just explain this to you. Then I will tell you the first example and the, I think that the others you will be able to work out on your own. So, see here what this image tells us is, see these are the rays which are undergoing refraction on the vertical axis and they are meeting here. So, I am just naming this point as FV. So, instead of calling it F1, F2, I am calling it FV. That is, this is the point where the rays undergoing refraction on the vertical axis are meeting. Now in another color, I am going to show you these rays. These are the rays which are undergoing refraction on the horizontal meridian and they are meeting here, that is FH. Now look at, there are multiple points A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now each of these points actually represents a refractive error. Right, so suppose we are asked that suppose the retina is at the point A. What is the refractive error at the point A? Now see, I will just help you with the first one. See. If we consider the retina to be at the point A, see both FV and FH are hypermetropic, right? Both of them are behind the retina. So, what is this point A representing? This is representing a compound hypermetropic astigmatism, right? Now, similarly, suppose we consider the point B. If we consider the point B, then at the point B, see FV is on the retina. So, FV is emetropic and FH is hypermetropic. So, this point represents a simple hypermetro. Right? Now, look at the point F. Suppose we take the point F. So, if we take the point F, see FH is on the retina and FV is myopic. So, this represents a simple hypermetro. And if I take the point G, then both FV and FH are myopic. So, this point G represents a compound hypermetro. Now, suppose I take the point D, what does it represent? See, if I take the point D, that is, if the retina is at the point D, see, FV is myopic and FH is hypermetro. So, this represents our mixed astigmatism. Okay, so basically what we have done in this one image is, we have put all those five images together. So, we learned this is one way in which the question can be asked. You can get just a single image and you can be asked to identify the refractive error. That's an easier question. But the same thing, this terms conoid also is not very difficult. In this, what has been done is all those four images, all those five images have been put together. So, when you get this terms conoid and if you are asked what is the refractive error if the retina is at the point A, B, D, etc., just forget all the other points. Just imagine that FV and FH are the two, two focal points and your retina is at the point A. So if the retina is at the point A, then see both FV and FH are behind, so they are hypermetropic. So both axes are hypermetropic, but one axis is more hypermetropic. So this point A represents a compound hypermetropic case. So likewise, you can work out all the other points. Right? So, this is what I had for you in this session. This was a short session to introduce or discuss the concept of the optics of the refractive errors. Now, as I said, this is like the questions of NEAT PG and ICT, they are all becoming more and more conceptual and refraction is like one of the most conceptual topics in ophthalmology. So, that's why 
I would want all of you to be able to identify these refractive errors. The images, I mean the refractive errors based on these images. So see this is simple myopia, simple hypermetropia, SMA, SHA, CMA, CHA and mixed ASD. And this is the Sturm's conoid where all these have been put together. So do go through these images. Once you are thorough with these images, it becomes much more easier to understand the next concept that is the glass prescription. So once we understand these images, it becomes much easier to decipher or decode glass prescriptions, which is what I will be discussing in another session, which will be our second session. Right? So I hope this session has been useful for you and I will come back with the next session on refraction where I will be discussing about the glass prescription. So bye-bye.